All right. Hey, hey, everybody. It is Kelly Nielsen with Grace for Living After Loss. And we are dedicated here at Grace for Living After Loss to help share encouragement, hope, and strength for those of you that are dealing with grief and loss. And we'd like to share tips, tools, and resources on how to not just get through it, but how to recover and learn to love your life again. And so we're going to be doing this loss series. We're going to be interviewing several different types of people who've experienced several different types of losses. And my hope for these interviews is that you can find at least one person that you resonate with, that you connect with. Maybe you have a similar type of loss as they do. Maybe you just, their personality resonates with you. And again, our goal is to just let you know that you're not alone and that recovery is possible and to just find commonality in our stories because it can feel so isolating when you go through grief and loss and that no one understands you and maybe nobody's been through this. And we just want to say that's not true. There are other people who've been through it. There are people who understand what you're going through. And we are here to encourage you and cheer you on every step of the way. So I am thrilled to have Vicki Turpening with us today. She has graciously and generously uh, offered to share her story and take some of her time to just share her experience with you again, as a source of encouragement and strength for you. So Vicki, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Kelly, for inviting me to talk to you today. Yeah. I'm thrilled that this might help someone else. Absolutely. I can say unequivocally, it will. You know, I it's one of my favorite things is all the comments that I see on the YouTube channel, people from around the world that find these videos and find hope and strength in them. And so um, and I know in my own story, it was me encountering other people who've been through loss that helped me to see that I could actually uh, move forward. And so 100%, I'm sure that it's going to be an encouragement to so many people. So I'm just going to let you start and share a little bit about the circumstances around the loss, who it, who it was that you lost, how long ago it was, and kind of just share with us what happened. Sure. Um, so... My most recent loss is my husband of five years, um, Michael. He and I actually met when we were in high school and met again as adults later in life and started dating and ended up getting married. And very unexpectedly, um, two months prior to his death, less than two months prior to his death, he was diagnosed with stage four cancer. We had no idea that he was that ill. We had no inkling he was sick at all. Wow. So that was a very uh, surreal experience. It felt very much like a television show where you get told the bad news and have a lot of things to process. Um, I'm very grateful, though, that we had that time together because a lot of people don't get that when someone dies suddenly. We had opportunities to not leave anything unsaid and i wouldn't call it closure but we were able to really focus on what was important and not leave anything at all unsaid yeah and that's fabulous that you can recognize like the gift that that was um but first of all so going back to that time and getting that devastating news right this devastating diagnosis and knowing that most likely the end is somewhat imminent what advice would you give a person in that situation i know like you're in shock and like you said it's kind of surreal and sort of out of body but like looking backwards if you could have if you could give one piece of advice to someone in that position what would you tell them oh gosh this is going to sound very counterintuitive and maybe a, a little bit selfish but you really need to take care of yourself um, what I did not realize going into this is the degree that grief and loss wrecks you physically, physiologically, your vitamin levels, your sleep, hormone levels, just a, a, a plethora of things. And I was so focused on Michael's care and making this easier for him and everyone else in our family. And we didn't really have an opportunity to tell a whole lot of people. Um, that's another piece of advice I would give to people is think very carefully, have like a communication plan, who you want to tell at what point in time, 
because you're inviting them not only into sharing your experience and your pain, but they're going to be processing a lot of the same feelings and emotions that you are. And it's that many more people's energy mm. that you have to manage coming at you and just that many more people to communicate with. That is such, see already, this is gold. Like that is such good advice for somebody who's in that situation. Remind me again, when, when was this? When did he receive the diagnosis and when did he pass? So he received his diagnosis May 31st, which was the day before my birthday. Mm. Most horrible birthday ever. Um, and he passed away July 27th. Of this past year, of 2023, yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Did you have, um, so you mentioned about talking to people and being strategic about that. Did you have someone that you kind of funneled things through? Did you have a point person that really acted as your communicator or were you kind of in that role talking to everyone? No, that was me. And I think that was, that was a mistake. Um, right. if, I, if I had to, if I could go back and do one thing over, that would definitely be one that I would have like a, a point a person or yeah, a communications yeah. person, or person or a small team of them anyways. Yeah. That's so good because that's actually so in our grief survival guide for, you know, once the loss has happened, that's one of the things we recommend and we call it like a grief buddy. Right. And we recommend that it be somebody a little bit removed from the situation because to your point, all the people who are very close are like going through their own process and their own emotions and, Again, like you mentioned, it messes up your brain, your ability to cognitively think and reason and put things together. And so the farther removed the person is, the more they can keep their kind of wits about them and be a true resource and a true help. So I usually recommend to folks, you know, have like someone you trust certainly and know, uh, maybe a more removed like family friend or something, somebody who can be more um, impartial is the wrong word, but do you know what I'm saying? That they can help you be an actual help to you. So yeah. It, they, they can actually be a help because it's not going to have the same emotional. Um, it, I'm trying to think of the word. It, it's not going to be as difficult for them because they are a little bit more removed where mm -hmm. all of your close family and friends, they're just as devastated as you are. Yeah. And here's another thing I want to throw out for people that they may not know. And it's not a service we offer here at Grace for Living After Loss, but there are um, people called death doulas who will come in and kind of play that role in a facilitator type fashion. And so they're trained um, similar to us, like coaches and counselors and stuff that just have a heart to help people. And so if you can't think of somebody that would be willing or able or a good fit for you, um, Google or certainly reach out to us and we'll connect you with people. But they, they help families go through this process and transition of loss and help to you know, be a sensible, you know, removed person that can help in, in that situation. So see already so much good stuff coming out of this. Tell me if you don't mind, and I hate bringing people back to this because neurologically we don't want to rehearse and rehash the loss all the time, but if you could share with us just the process, the, the actual loss itself and how that was for you. Um, it, I, it was unique in the sense that, um, when you're diagnosed with an illness and you know that it's terminal, it, the doctors always give you a time frame of how much time you have left. So we were operating under the assumption that we had some time left between one to three years. Oh, wow. Okay. So our plan was all around having one to three years, you know, checking off some last bucket list items, things that Michael wanted to do before he, you know, left this earth, you know, because he was not at all done living. Mm -hmm. He was four and a half years into seminary. He wanted to write a book. Um, he actually wanted to teach at a Christian college. So he was having to kind of reset um, his expectations and he just never got healthy enough. 
Um, he had some complications along with the cancer that they just never were able to get under control. And that's ultimately what he ended up passing away from mm. um, very suddenly. And again, you know, we had a few days um, knowing that he probably wasn't going to survive. Um, but I think I experienced some of the shock factor that people experience when a loved one suddenly dies away it, because we were expecting, you know, one to three years, not right. a week. Right. And how old, how old was he? He was 54. 54. So really young. Yeah. 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 And so um, when it actually did happen and you, and you touched on this, how long would you say like the shock kind of numb part of it lasted for you? At the time I thought it was a week. But looking back now that there's been some distance, I think it was several weeks because I can look back now at things that I wrote or did, and I don't remember doing it mm -hmm. at all. I mean, you just go into this. One thing I don't think people realize, especially with really close losses in your immediate family, is just how much comes at you and falls on you you know, the logistics of planning a service and, you know, their burial or cremation and, you know, the estates and the you know, daily living. And if you have kids, you, and it's your spouse, you become a single parent all of a sudden. <clears throat> You've also got everyone around you grieving, people wanting to console you. Um, safe people, that's a whole other topic of <laughs> <laughs> who's okay to share your grief with mm. a, lot, a lot of people don't know right how to help you right or they have their own unresolved grief or trauma so they're really not a safe people. person yeah. and everyone has the very best of intentions it's just our our society has a lot of work to do around dying and death in terms of how to process navigate deal with it and then come through it on the other side. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, let, so let's just talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Talk to me about how it was with the people around you and whether, you know, how it affected your relationships with them. How um, did they show up for you in healthy, helpful ways or were they a drain? Like, just talk to me a little bit about your original hope and expectations for the people around you and then what actually happened <laughs> because those are usually very different yeah um this is where your person can be of help um because they can help um gatekeep a lot of this for you so yeah you expect um there there will be a lot of people that show up for you and more than you think and it's usually unexpected people that show up for you. Um, some people can't handle it. They either can't handle your pain and being around your pain. Um, they're dealing with their own grief. You know, they're grieving the same loss, just in a different way. And mm -hmm. they can't handle your grief too. Mm -hmm. um, they may have another loss that this is triggering for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they think that by sharing that loss with you is helpful. And mm -hmm. people like, you know, I'm really not knocking anyone personally because a lot of what I'm sharing, I've done myself in other <laughs> situations, not knowing any better, you know, because you so desperately want to say or do something to make the other person feel better or make it better when really there's not a thing that you can say or do that's going to make it better, make it okay. It's just something that you've got to get through. Um, so it, it, a common thing is people will want to share their loss. Yeah. Give you the details and, oh, it's just like this. You know, ne it's never just like this. Every yeah. loss is different. You know, your, your best friend dying of an overdose is not the same as my husband dying. Right. Yeah. And another thing that people don't realize is 
you've probably already had 50 or 100 or several hundred of these same types of conversations and you're already numb from your own loss and to have everybody else's energy and sadness and trauma come at you like you just cannot process it yeah so a a helpful tip that my um, company's grief counselor gave me was to go into narrator mode in my own head when people are presenting information like that where i just repeat back in my own mind what they're telling me kind of like a reporter would that way i'm not internalizing it but i'm still engaged in the conversation and i've preserved enough energy that i can figure out an exit strategy of how to end that conversation because the person they always mean well they, they really think that you know by relating to you through loss is a way to help you yeah you've been thinking that this is probably your 63rd conversation that you've had and that you just can't do it anymore yeah yeah oh these are all such good things and i know for those of you that are familiar with us and our process for us this is our step two we call it protecting the path and just taking time to be intentional and strategic around who you're sharing yourself with and the environments you're subjecting yourself to and to have a plan and a strategy. And one of those strategies and a little tip, especially if you're new, is voicemail. Don't feel the need to answer the phone. Like the phone does not need to be answered. And guess what? Every voicemail doesn't need to be responded to or returned, right? So this is a time grief recovery is a time for us to be self-focused, right? And it's our recovery. And so giving yourself permission to make the choices that serve you, that help you, because all these people who are trying to, they love you, right? And what they want for you is to heal and recover from this. And so I just want to give everyone watching permission that whatever choices and boundaries you need to put in place for your season of recovery so that you can truly actually recover, that's what you need to do. And I think all these people that are reaching out to you would want that as well. So I know a lot of people feel the need to be there for other people or respond or whatever, but if it's at the detriment of your own healing, then it's counterproductive. And how long, I'd, I'd be curious to hear your opinion, how long would you say until all the people kind of go back to their life, right? There's this influx, there's this overwhelming amount of people reaching out and trying to help and wanting to talk about it. But then at some point that kind of dries up and everybody goes back to their life. What would you estimate that time frame was in your experience? So very quickly in most everyone, probably about three weeks. Exactly. <laughs> they want to get back to work. Um, you know, the the loss for a lot of people just isn't as close as it is for you. So, of course, that's natural and normal that they go back. Um, and they also, if they've not experienced this, they don't know what this is like for you. Yeah. It, this is not something that you're going to, like, get over in a month, right. or six weeks or six months. That This is something that you're going to have to learn how to carry and live yeah. with and incorporate that person into your life going forward. So it's very different for you. And I really, I think this is super hard to try to identify with until you've actually been through it. Cause it, it's, it's mind bending how much yeah. life changes and how much yeah. comes at you all at once. It, yeah. It's a, it's a process. Yeah. So to, to echo your comment about boundaries don't feel um, guilty or that you're being mean or that it's your job to take every care of everyone else and right. make them feel better. Watch out for you know your kids, may, you know maybe your parents and everyone else. They can find a friend or another relative because you cannot take care of everyone and, and boundaries. You you need to have them very quickly. Um, and that that was one thing that didn't even occur to me that I would need to figure out what my boundaries were and get them in place um, pretty quickly. Yeah. And thankfully, I had a friend um, who was widowed, um, I think, like 10, 12 years ago, and she reminded me of that. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. And it's so it cracks me up 
that you said three weeks because that's literally that's what I always say. I'm like, it's about three weeks and then everybody goes back to their life and you're left sitting there. So for a lot of people, too, that's kind of when like the reality sinks in and some of the shock and numbness wears off because the first couple of weeks it's funeral and people bringing you meals and you're kind of surrounded and inundated by all this, you know, attention, love and support, whatever. And it's very surreal, right? You're not living your normal life. And then at some point, everybody goes back to their life and you grapple with, you know, going back to work and trying to learn how to live, you know, in, in this new future that you find yourself in, you know? So, um, yeah. And boundaries are, are very good and very necessary. And I want to say too, like, it is really important to find someone who isn't attached to help you process. So whether it's a coach, whether it's a counselor, what it could be a friend that, like you said, that has experienced loss, that's maybe more far removed, because I know that was something that kind of surprised me. And we've talked about it earlier that for me, my sister is a close person, right? And I thought my sister would be a source of support. But then I realized she had her own grief. She wasn't able to support me because she had her own grief that she was needing to contend with. And that can be a hard pill for people to swallow when you think you think that your support is going to be your close friends and family. And depending on who you lost, they may just be doing all they can do to keep their own head above water. And so not taking it personally, not, you know, wallow like not focusing on the disappointment of the fact that they can't be there for you but to very quickly turn and find additional resources you need to find the people that are going to be a uh, unbiased like just a support for you right and be able to hear and receive all that you have and be a support for you and so um the sooner people can find that i think the better yes yeah and they they do tend to show up uh, both of my siblings, my brother came up here numerous times. My sister flew in and stayed with me and took care of me because the first week or two, I really was not functioning. Uh, right. I, I had such trouble focusing uh, with attention span, memory. Um, I kept losing my keys and my phone and what day of the week is it? And it, it was it was extremely frustrating because I you know, she'd have to tell me three times a day, like today's trash day. Right. <laughs> Basic things that I just couldn't. I couldn't. Or even to eat. Like, you know, yeah. when, when we, it's like, if you can eat and shower, possibly, you know, if that's like, like the bar needs to be super, super low. But yeah, you're, that was one of the things that was surprising to me, the physicality of it, you know, not even just like, the memory and the lack of energy, but like feeling like you had the flu. Like I felt like I had the flu for the longest time, like just so run down and exhausted. How long did that last? Or are you still feeling some of those effects at this stage in the game? So a lot of it has gotten better. Um, I tend to find when the widow brain shows back up, there's something that I'm not paying attention to or that I'm in the midst of some sort of grief ambush. I'm either in it or getting out of it. And if I'm getting out of it, sometimes the lack of fo focus and attention span and the fatigue, oh my gosh, the fatigue, you need more sleep. That eating, taking a shower and sleeping needs to be your priority sleep, especially for quite some time, because your brain is just going in overdrive mm -hmm. constantly on just a multitude of things that you don't think about or expect and processing all the emotional stuff that you really need more sleep. Um, and I find when I don't pay attention to that or think, you know, oh, well, it'll be okay. I'll just sleep in tomorrow or make up for it the next day. Um, sometimes I'll pay for that. Um, yeah. I've been very diligent um, at, at that. You really learn, how, or it's an opportunity to really learn how to take care of yourself, how to listen yeah. to your body, how to be aware. I'm like so acutely aware of what my limits are and what I need to do to not exceed my limits and all that kind of stuff. You know, like I'm much more in tune with my physical energy, my emotional energy, all that kind of stuff, because you you kind of have to be in order to survive and recover. 
And I did want to say too, as it relates to sleep a little like, so neurologically, um, a little bit of neuroscience here, your brain is overwhelmed and flooded with chemicals and hormones and all these things. And it's a mess. And our brains don't like mess. Our brains thrive on patterns and predictability. So one gift that you can give yourself if you're grieving is to set and keep a bedtime routine to go to bed at the same time every day and have a bit of like a 30 minute routine, whether it's brushing your teeth, washing your face. It'd be great if it's like a warm shower or stretching or yoga, just physical cues to let your brain know, oh, it's time to go to sleep now. And to do that consistently is going to help to restore order and bring structure back to your mind. And you're going to start to slowly regain energy, right? Like the energy, you're so drained because your brain is like, jumping from confusion to anger to sadness like your brain is just all over the place and that's very draining so one of those strategies we give folks in the beginning is any actually any kind of structure that you can implement if you can wake up at the same time every day even better if you can eat at least one meal at the same time every day better yet like so as much as you can structure as you can implement that isn't overwhelming is really going to be helpful Mm -hmm. yeah and eat, eat healthy and eat clean yeah, I know. My goodness, it's so tempting to want to sit down with a gallon of ice cream or a drink or whatever it might be. And those are very short term, you know, the, in the long term, that's not helping you at all. At the same time, too, I always tell people like now is not the time to like embrace paleo and CrossFit or whatever. Like be gentle and kind, <laughs> be gentle and kind to yourself. But as much as you can. And that's an easy thing, too, if other people are offering and bringing you food and gifts or whatever to just make the request that it be healthy, whole type foods, good nutrition. It's also a good idea to throw in supplements. Um, If you're not if you don't take supplements now, it would be a good time to add that to your routine to just give your body some extra extra oomph, extra fight, you know? Yeah, I take a massive amount of supplements and I highly recommend that. it really helps because at first and even maybe even for a long while, you're not going to eat normally. Um, For me, for months, I would eat four or five bites of food and that would be all I could eat. If I tried to force myself to eat more, I just couldn't. Um, That has gotten better. So in a way I kind of, uh, set myself up for intermittent fasting. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not you know, I yeah. can't recommend this diet plan at all. <laughs> but, um, yeah, supplements help, especially at first when you're going through, when you're just exhausted and, you know, your brain's in overdrive. I think for me that lasted about, I want to say a month, maybe even a little longer. But I think part of the duration of that is, toward the end of Michael's illness, I was not sleeping. Um, I was so focused on his care and his needs. And, you know, he would have, uh, he would be coughing at night or not feeling well. Then he was in the hospital and I stayed in the hospital almost the entire time, the last week of his life. So by the time he passed away, I don't think I had slept probably more than six, eight hours in like six days. Yeah. So I was already wrung out, exhausted going into that. Um, And then once someone dies, there's just so much to do and plan and your phone's blowing up with phone, the phone calls and text messages and emails. And then you've got to formulate a plan and yeah, it's, it's a lot and it, it will keep you up at night. Yeah. And restoring sleep. And and we have other videos on the channel as well. If you're watching this and sleep is an issue, we have videos because doing everything you can to maintain or restore sleep is like one of the first to do's because lack of sleep is just going to exacerbate everything else. It's just going to make everything else worse. And so I know it's easier said than done. And I know it takes a bit. So like, studying and learning tips and implementing a routine, doing everything that you can to try to get to a place where you're sleeping, you know, six to eight hours of night uninterrupted is like priority number one. Um, Because once you do that, then you're going to gain a little bit more energy and mental capacity to even begin to try to process the loss and make all the decisions you need to make and all that kind of stuff. So sleep 100% is 
is agenda item number one when, I, when I'm talking with folks. Um, okay, so I want to ask, because it's a debate, like, do you at this stage in the game, it's been, you know, you're still relatively new in this process and journey. And and I love, um, I know you're going to be working with Janelle and, and a group going through our program, but I love your attitude, your posture, your position, your your the way that you're approaching your recovery. And so I want to ask, like, if you believe that recovery is possible for you, and if so, how and why did you come to that conclusion? Or I don't want to jump ahead. Do you believe that recovery is, is possible, that you're going to recover from this? Yes. Um, I, you know, very truthfully at this moment, I don't yet know how, but, okay. um, I know that Janelle's got me on that <laughs> and you do as well. Um, I also have a strong faith. It, you kind of can't not when you have a husband who spent four and a half years in seminary. Yeah. Um, actually, he and I did a lot of talking, um, about, you know, his expectations and his wants for me going forward without mm. him. So we had a lot of those conversations of what getting through this would look like and what I might need. And he even offered suggestions and um, strongly encouraged me to be open to finding love again eventually. Um, I don't know about that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> one step at a time. One step. I appreciate the sentiment. <laughs> Get through this first. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I don't. You, that is something that you have to put effort into, and usually it's at the point in time when you don't want to. So you know, if I, you know, if anybody is in a situation where you know your spouse is terminal the time to start planning and it does feel a little bit morbid and i even asked him at a couple points in time if it bothered him that i was like making lists and plans and coming up with ideas of what to do and how to cope after he died mm -hmm. and he said that it was odd because he didn't want to leave me mm. but it, he said it also gave him great comfort to know that I had some sort of fallback plan, something, you know, even if I ended up not following through on it and something else materialized that I was taking those steps toward that. Yeah. I also have two sons and I don't ever want them to feel like they're not enough, you know, that, you know, mm -hmm. mom gave up and she's never been the same since. And, you know, things never will be the same but they can be something else. We're still figuring out what that something else is, but um, God doesn't want us to wallow in misery and sadness and sorrow um, throughout our lives when something like this happens. Um, and that can be a challenge to pull yourself out of that when the loss is really, really uh, close. Yeah. I love that. That is a commercial. Like, whether it is that you lost your your spouse or a child, especially if you're a parent and you have other children. And I'm going to say, even if you don't have other children, if you're a Christian, there's no sitting on the bench if you're a Christian. Like the rest of us actually need you to play your part. You know, you need to figure out this work of recovery and just dis, dis, designing and deciding what the next season is supposed to look like so that you can fully participate with that season. And I 100% agree, things will never be the same and you will never be the same, period. So just, if you're trying to go back and you want things to be the way they were, or you expect you to be the way that you were, like that will never happen. But what can happen is a, a beautiful season in front of you. And you, like you said, you don't know what that looks like. You're, you're at the very beginning stages of even determining what that might be. But I'm here to tell you, and I'm an example of somebody who has had a very rich, very meaningful, very purposeful season after a couple of really tremendous traumatic losses, right? And so I'm here to say that it is available for people. And I'm so excited, you know, we're, you're about to jump in the group with Janelle and we are gonna do like a post group interview because I think you're gonna have um, A, the thing about I can recover, but I don't know how 
that's going to be answered for you. You're going to be walking in your recovery. And I think that you're going to begin to see gleamings of what this next season might look like. I don't expect that you'll have the full picture laid out for you, but, and that honestly, and not to, I, please hear me. I'm not trying to minimize the pain of loss, but that actually, when you get to the place of designing and dreaming with God about what the next, it's kind of an adventure. It's kind of, you know, like you never expected to have to go through this, but here you are, right? And I'm here to tell you that God has good things in store for you. And so the fact that you have no idea what those things are right now, and that he's going to show you and reveal it to you, it is a bit of like an adventure. And I think that Michael is watching with anticipation and like excited to see what unfolds in this next season for you. And that is my hope for everybody that's going through loss that they could get to a place to view it that way. And I understand there's very real hurt. There's very real processing. There's very real heavy things that you have to work through and learn how to navigate and manage before you can get to that place. But I'm here to just plant the seed of hope for everybody that it is possible to get to that place. And actually in shorter time than what a lot of us think, you know, the program you're going to go on is 12 weeks and we see miraculous, tremendous acceleration and healing happen in 12 weeks. And so that is my hope and belief for you. And I look super, I'm super excited to hear about it and then chat with you again on the other side of the 12 weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, as we're like wrapping up, is there anything else that we like didn't cover anything? Again, if people, you know, husbands, wives are watching that maybe recently lost a spouse, anything you would want to tell them? Um, I think one of the things early on that helped me be realistic about this and not feel like I'm the only person who's ever gone through this is just the realization that if you're in an intact marriage, this is going to happen to 50% of us men or women at some point in our lives. Unfortunately, loss is just a part of the human condition. This is just a part of life. You know, we, we know how this all ends. It, right. it, this all ends for all of us. Some of us just find out sooner that it's going to end sooner. And everyone left behind has to deal with it. Um, now, also, I, I had a conversation yesterday with a, a colleague and a friend of mine about change management. And we had this wonderful debate about the degree that your own free will comes into this. And change is just a condition. Um, he says change just, just is. Um, and, and that's very true. It took me a few minutes to wrap my head around that because we think that this is something that we can control and we really can't. Right. And that's part of this grieving process is realizing we think we have control, but right. we really don't. Right. And that, it, that can be scary to, and I think that's part of the reason why grief has so, so many uh, fear components to it is because we don't have, we, we really don't have control. A hundred percent. We don't have control of what happens externally. I will tell you the one thing we can control and is our thoughts and our emotions. People think our thoughts and emotions just happen to us, but we can learn to control our thoughts and emotions. And if you'll embrace that journey, you'll be on that for the rest of your life. And the more you're able to master your thoughts and emotions, the more the fact that you can't control anything besides your thoughts and emotions is it's okay. Like it's okay because it doesn't matter to me what happens to me out here because I know I have learned and learning and practicing and honing the skill to control my response, right? And control my state of peace regardless of what happens. And that actually, if that is something that you learn and develop and grow in because of this loss, it's a really beautiful gift because it's the only way, it's actually the only solution for living, having any kind of semblance of peace in this world with everything that's going on is to A, understand you're not in control of anything except for your thoughts and emotions, and then commit yourself to the work of learning how to control your thoughts and emotions. And so 
Um, if that's something that comes out of this for you in a greater capacity, then that is actually a tremendous gift and it will serve you well the rest of your days here. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, Vicki, it's a delight. Thank you again for sharing your time, sharing your story and sharing hope with other husbands and wives who are dealing with the loss of their spouse. Um, and again, I look forward to part two of our conversation when you're on the other side, having gone through uh, gone through the 12 week program with Janelle. Great. I look forward to it. Yeah. All right. For everybody else watching, if you want to, we're going to be doing more interviews in this loss series. So be sure to check back to find um, a loss that is similar to something you've been through. And we hope you found this encouraging and helpful. See ya.